Welcome to the third in a series of introductory training videos for the iMachining for NX CAM software. In this video, we will be covering 3D iMachining. So 3D iMachining is a recognition 3D toolpath version of the iMachining toolpath that we saw in the previous video. So here we're actually going to see how to program the 3D version. So just to cover the basics again, I'll go to create operation. Type is iMachining. This time we'll choose the 3D iMachining icon. I've set up all the same sort of parameters here in terms of location. So we'll open the toolpath. Again, as a user-defined operation, we're not going to see too much in terms of a dialog in this window. We need to go to the user parameters. So the 3D version does not require the selection of geometry. The geometry itself is the workpiece. We're going to look at the stock, look at the workpiece, find the difference between the two, and machine off those differences. So the only thing you actually have to set up here is, firstly, the settings. We'll go in here and we'll make sure that we have our machine and our material selected. In terms of the technology, there are two technologies for 3D I machining, 3D General and 3D Prismatic. The Prismatic is essentially just the pres Prismatic version of the software where it's just going to look at any Prismatic features of your part, length, width, and then a depth. No tapered edges or curvature is machined by the Prismatic. The 3D General is the full version of the toolpath, meaning that if there are any curvatures or tapered faces, we will add scallop steps to those features. But otherwise, 3D I machining will machine everything that it sees of the part. The working area is actually to limit the travel of the tool, to limit the, the recognition of this toolpath. And we'll see that once we get into, the, uh, into another toolpath, but essentially, uh, this toolpath will machine the difference between the blank, the raw material, and the workpiece. If we put a working area, we essentially are just telling it to still look at the workpiece, still look at the blank, but only machine what it finds inside of a particular piece of geometry. Going down the list, you can see that we have holder collision protection. As a 3D toolpath, we might want to make sure that any holders we define on the tool do not collide with the piece as we travel through the part. This is beneficial in terms of uh, a part where you haven't really had a chance to look at it and know that there's going to be uh, reach issues with your tool. If your tool is not sticking out of your holder long enough and it might collide with the wall as it goes deep into the pocket, this will avoid those collisions and recalculate the toolpath to still machine what you want to machine within the limits of the, of the, of the holder. Now, as a recognition toolpath in the levels, there actually isn't a start and end. What you're really just doing is saying the upper level is where you want to start looking at the workpiece, and the lower level is how much of the workpiece you want to machine. In this case, I want to look at the entire piece. So I'm going to look at the top and the bottom. Cut parameters, the specifics of the toolpath, what happens inside of it. So again, this is a purely roughing toolpath. So I'm going to have wall offsets, floor offsets, and as it's a 3D, I have a scallop offset. So if there were any tapered faces, any kind of curvature that I'm, I'm going to be 3D machining, I want to leave some steps behind. And this is basically just the height of that step. As we saw in the previous video, we have morph spiral controls. So this will generate a eye machining toolpath on all the levels, on all the features, and it will make sure to add a morphing spiral on each one of these planes, each one of these flat surfaces. Additionally, we have control over the channels, much as we saw in the second video. So as we're machining these different flat areas, there might be a need to add some channels. So again, these two sets of parameters are applied to the overall piece. So we'll click apply on that. Non-cutting moves, again, as we saw in the previous video, this is just the control over the helical entry. In this case, though, the helical entry may apply to all the different levels that we might be machining. That being said, as it machines the material, it knows what it has machined, so chances are it'll try and find a way to come from the side. So there might not be as many helical entries as if we were to do this with just purely 2D I machining. As we saw in the previous video as well, iMachining will calculate the feeds and speeds for us. Now, we've got the feed and the spin blacked out because those are calculated off the machine and the material information and the dimensions of the animal that we provided before we came through this toolpath. In the 
wizard section, we're telling it what material the tool is made out of and the helical angle of the flute of that end mill. Both those parameters, again, go into the eye machining calculation to optimize the cut. Once all that information is in, put in, we can take a look at the wizard, and this will tell us the steps that it'll take to machine this part. So the flute length is actually 1.5 inches in length. And the step down for this part, for this, this maximum depth of the part here, is about an inch 0.24. So we're still using as much of the flute as possible. So the depth of cut is 1.24, but there's still just a little bit of the flute that is not engaging the material. So the ACP, the actual cutting points along the flute, is only set to 7.8 or 0.78. So 78% of the tool's use. It's still as optimized as possible because that overall length of the, of the end mill, the flute length, there's no way you're gonna use that entire flute length because this part is just not deep enough. But if this was a deeper part, we would see multiple steps of that maximum depth. Depth. Now, as it goes along, so let's say to this flat right here, and possibly any other flats or steps we have in the part, you'll see that it, uh, it will reduce the step down because there's just not that much material to machine. So as a recognition toolpath, it looks at the part and understands where it is at, at any point in the machining process. The aggressiveness of the operation is controlled by the machining level, like we saw in video two. We have one to eight. And if I change each one of these, it will change the feed and speed. So right now we have a feed of 73 inches per minute. If I set this to level eight, it is a feed rate of 100 inches per minute. So again, similar to what we saw in video two, just applied to the third dimension. I'm gonna cancel out of here because I've already calculated this toolpath. As we can see, it machined everything it could find. So it approached from the outside of the stock, outside of the blank and machined the outside to remove any bits of material that was outside. As it goes inside, it does a morphing spiral into that main pocket, some channeling over here, some deslotroid coital into the corners. If I angle the part just a little bit, you'll see that it also recognized that there was a flat right there. So each one of those steps, those flats, it added an additional eye machining toolpath there. And then in the center, it recognized that it can remove that hole as well. So all of that was done in one toolpath. But let's say we didn't want to do this entire part. We just wanted to limit the eye machining to just the inside. Well, let's go to edit. And I mentioned before, the only geometry you would actually select is the working area. So let's go ahead and do that. So by choosing just this chain on the top here, what I'm actually telling eye machining is that I want to machine just inside that area. So I'll go, okay, let's recalculate that. And as you can see, the same tool, the same parameters, but I told it to limit the travel to just inside that chain that I selected. It still applied eye machining, so it still did that center hole. It still machined that flat there, leaving 10 thou on all the walls and the floors, but it did it only inside of the geometry that I selected. So this very powerful toolpath can be limited to certain areas if that's all you needed it for. One other thing to note about 3D eye machining is that it is a recognition toolpath, meaning that it looks at the updated stock. So in our case, if I change the tool to a half inch, but don't change anything else about the parameters, it's still the same depth, uh, the same upper level, lower level, it's still the same part. I'm just basically telling it to work just on what was left behind by the previous tool. So as we can see, that one inch diameter end mill could only do so much in the corners, the half inch came in later and finished all the corners. So the corners on top of that step, the corners on the main floor, and the corners inside the hole. I can keep stepping down the tool, keep making a copy of that 3D eye machining toolpath, and it'll just keep working away on the part. This is one of the more powerful toolpaths from eye machining, and it usually is the one that I recommend to start with because as you can see, it roughs out all the material. Now you can just go right into finishing it with your other toolpath. Any questions on this or anything else from iMachining, you can always give us a call at our main tech line found on our website. And the entire series of intro videos will be available um, by, by download and by YouTube. Just give us a call and we can do demonstrations of the software as well. Thanks for watching.